thanks for inviting uh, 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 Massey, Ben, and others. Uh, thanks for <laughs> organizing all of the things. So this is uh, actually going back to the horses that uh, Yaromir uh, talked about. Uh, luckily, Yaromir just told me uh, why horses had, uh, uh, why they had a selection. Apparently, we forced them to select. But uh, this talk will go back to that thing, and it's a. Uh, um, I am in Warwick. It's the same department with Paul and Dario and Yere and others, but I will advocating of not using diffusion. <laughs> and uh, so my work started with uh, collaborating with Andreas, who is, a, who is a professor in Austria, and they had like uh, uh, do similar sort of things. I think given uh, a lot of you know about population genetics, I'll skip that, but I'll go to the picture, the sort of data they collect it's more about uh, the Drosophila, the flies. So they uh, take a lot of flies, they put into this, whatever it's called, and then uh, let them breed for generations. I think they take, uh, they do it for 100 generations of breeding them. I think it takes four or five years. And then put these poor flies to like extreme heat or lots of lights or all sorts of weird situations. And then they, of course, that every generation they're uh, sequencing them. So then they check whether their, the sequences of the genes, uh, things like that, has changing. So here, the 0, 30, and 100, these are like different generations of the flies. And what you get, like each of the rows here, so it's a haploid individual. So each of the rows, you get this sort of configuration, ATCG, which you have learned in our high school. And then you get the SNPs, and you can comp like get to the haplotypes, and then you get uh, allele frequencies. So now the question is, if there is a selection due to this extreme heat or extreme sort of like loss of light, is there a change in the allele frequency? So if you have a change, you will uh, see that, so in, in this case, you can have different alleles. So I will talk about multi-locus setups, like when you have two locus or three locus. Uh, in the year, Amir's talked about one locus. We will also first talk about one locus. So let's say you have these different allele frequencies and one of the alleles had a selection of 0.05 then you see they kind of going up. And then all of the others, which has not been selected, they stay kind of neutral around where they started frequency. And uh, to note that this frequency has to be uh, sum up to 0 to I mean 1. So they are restricted in between 0 to 1. That's why the whole right vision model is restricted, and then the diffusion and all these things gets into trouble. So uh, traditionally, when people start thinking about, they came up this equation of evolution of the haplotypes is a like discrete time multinomial distribution, okay? And that's, I think, still holds as because when you are dealing with 100 generations, it definitely is not delta t not going to infinity, uh, not going to zero, and then you have not n going to infinity many generations. So justifying a diffusion in these sort of setups, and most of the genetic time series data you get, is rather difficult. So I will kind of try to advocate that, and I will say why using diffusion in, the, diffusion in these sort of setups are a little bit difficult. So you can also go to two locus extensions when you will have uh, many more haplotypes, so in this case four haplotypes, and you have recombination. So we uh, consider all sorts of setups. I'm not explaining what the recombination rates here means and how they affect, but it makes uh, inference much more complicated of the selection coefficients. But, I mean, this is a two locus extension, and you can actually construct a diffusion equation for all of these cases. I mean, you have a one locus case, two locus case, three locus, all of them can be written down. Um, in recent papers, I think like uh, Yaromir mentioned about the Hay and Beaumont, their work, where they actually use a two locus uh, right Fisher diffusion equation underlying a hidden Markov model. And so you can just take a limit and you get a diffusion equation like that. But the most Problem, why, why the diffusion equation is problematic? One thing, uh, firstly, uh, Yaromir mentioned that they're in this restricted domain of zero to one. So if you just run Oil and Mariama, they're going to be wrong. Uh, uh, <laughs> they, like you can correct all sorts of things. I know Masi tried to tell me that they can be done, but they're going to be always as to be a bias. Secondly comes the Paul and Dario's method, which is exact simulation. Uh, they work, but 
I mean, for specific setups, like when you have a selection, you need to go to Yaromir. Yaromir's difficult math. I don't understand all this math. But the main difficulties is that they are also rather uh, slow. I mean, you just try to simulate them, uh, it takes quite a long time. So if you are just using those sort of models as a simulator model, it's not going to be flexibly easy to do. So, and primarily my argument is when I looked into the data set with these Austrians, it's only 100 generations or 50 generations. I mean, horses has like um, 1,000 generations. And I mean, d I mean, why do I need to do a diffusion? I can just do a right Fisher standard discrete model. So the question is that if I have one locus, two locus, multiple loci, can I uh, infer the selection coefficient? And if they have recombination and the problem is much more difficult, can I still infer the selection coefficient? So we'll try to address it. The main difficulty, we know that likelihood is intractable. So what can we do when you have a likelihood int intractable? In a nice talk by Arno, he was pointing to some of the new directions. I think like uh, my methods I will propose, they'll touch some similarity with Arno's uh, methods. So I know that standard posterior is inaccessible in a Bayesian setup as because I cannot evaluate density, but I'm hoping to be able to simulate from the data. So if I don't consider diffusion, then I can go back to the multinomial setup so I can simulate from the data. So there is no mistake. I should be able to uh, use it. So then I have a simulator model for which I can simulate data but don't have a likelihood. And this is a setup, I mean, before going into the right feature, I have all my life has pretty much worked with the likelihood for inference. Generally, I always uh, said, use ABC, approximate Bayesian computation. And I have written a Python package, which kind of covers all of them. But after working almost 10 years, I realized, I now tell that don't use ABC. With the same student for the same problem, we tried to use ABC. Uh, the two main bottlenecks is that first you need to come up with the summary statistics, which makes uh, meaning for that data set. Any theoretical consistency results you see for ABC assumes your summary statistics is Gaussian. So, I mean, where this comes from, I don't know. Secondly, ABC do not really scale up for parameters which are very high dimensional, more than 10 dimension. I, I think like one, of the, one paper with Richard, I, we dealt with like 15 or 16 parameters. That's the highest parameter dimension I know. Another popular method is Bayesian synthetic likelihood. Um, uh, it's, I, I will say that, I will show uh, the setup we will go, we will say, point out that this is a special case of what we are going to be doing. But the problem with the Bayesian synthetic likelihood is that it can converge to a parameter value which is not as close to, and nowhere, nothing to do with your true parameter value. The reason being it's not a correct sort of scoring rule. So we will we'll just point to that. Um, so what do we want to do? We want to do generalized Bayesian inference, not the variational one, but what is generalized Bayesian inference in this setup we mean? So there was this uh, lot of uh, recent works where you just have the posterior, look at to the posterior, and then just take the log p y given theta, replace with uh, this term when you have negative w, you have the l y given theta. So what is this l? So this is the loss function. Uh, in, in, in Arno's talk, uh, he mentioned that L2 loss, but should we be choosing the L2 loss? But what loss should you choose? And what is the justification when you choose a loss and you give the posterior distribution? Where does it uh, come from? So we thought quite a bit of that. So there are advantages, drawbacks. I'm not going to so much. Uh, we can talk offline about them. But let's look into the choice of loss. How do we choose the loss? Then Looking into literature, so we bumped into a lot of work by one of these famous uh, statistician uh, you can have ever produced is Epi David, which was in Cambridge based. And he always talked about scoring rules, minimum scoring rule estimator, and then frequential scoring rule. Uh, somehow it never been taken up. So the main idea, which was more popular in the meteorological community, where we actually learn from the meteorologists, not from the statisticians, is because statisticians forgotten about the scoring rules. So the meteorologist told me that there is something called scoring rules. What is a scoring rule? Scoring rule is like you have a distribution p theta, and you observed y, which is your observation. So how do you measure that your predicted distribution matches your uh, data? So it kind of will tell you is your uh, model or the simulator model is good enough. And that's they call scoring rule. A nice thing about there are scoring rules which you can estimate. You can get an unbiased estimate of the scoring rule if you can sample from uh, the simulator model of the p theta. 
and they have a uh, huge literature. I mean, not just uh, suggesting some scoring rules, showing consistency results and uh, geometry of the scoring rules, like information geometry of those things. Epi David has done a ton of work, so we just leverage on that. Now, the point is that they say that if I take a scoring rule of that sort, and now if I integrate also over the y, I can define this thing, my expected scoring rule. And you can say that the expected scoring rule would be proper if this thing is minimized when p theta is equal to p0, and if it is strictly proper when you have unique minimum. So under these two criterions, you can justify that if you do a minimum scoring rule estimation, then they would be consistent. So if you have a strictly proper scoring rule, if you're using, your, uh, you will have a consistent estimation, or if you're doing Bayesian, this sort of scoring rule-based inference, you, your posterior distribution will always concentrate on the true parameter value. Uh, I will not talk about the theoretical details. We have other papers where you can show the Bernstein Formicis type results, robustness, and things like that. Uh, but the main idea is that if you have a scoring rule, you can, which is strictly proper, you can easily construct a divergence out of that. And one of the most popular scoring rules is the negative log likelihood, which gives us the kullback ladder divergence. But in this case, I cannot estimate the negative log likelihood. So let's use some other scoring rules. So the rather popular ones comes back to like the log score, which is the which would be the doing standard Bayesian inference, right, which uh, you have the negative log likelihood. And then you can use energy score, which used quite a lot in the literature. And then you can use the kernel score, which is which mentioned by Arno recently as the MMD score. And MMD has a justification as a strictly proper scoring rule under some assumptions. And it has been thoroughly studied by Nating, uh, David, and others. So you can e easily plug it inside this sort of setup, and you can show that it has, it gives you the Bernstein von Mises type results, and also sort of robustness and small size sample um, asymptotics. And the nice part is that both energy score and the kernel score, you can get an unbiased estimate you can, if you can sample from your true distribution. So let's say, um, what can we do? If, if I now, if I'm, I'm more or less uh, define the posterior distribution based on the scoring rules, now how would I sample from these uh, posterior distribution? So here in this talk, I will concentrate purely on the pseudo-marginal MCMC, uh, which basically says you have an unbiased estimate of the scoring rule, plug inside the posterior, and you have an estimate of the posterior. This is not anymore an unbiased estimate of the posterior and just use that unbiased estimate of the, uh, the estimate of the posterior in your MCMC and see whether it gives you a true uh, sample from the target distribution. You actually can theoretically verify that if you do this strategy, the MCMC sample would converge to your two posterior distributions defined by the scoring rule. And that's one of the theorems we prove in our paper. Uh, so let's just, uh, as because these needed to be proved is because this is not a standard pseudo-marginal setup, as because expectation of the posterior, would not, it, it is not an unbiased system of the posterior, what you need for the pseudo-marginal setup. But you can prove and you can use it inside any MCMC scheme, and we will use population Monte Carlo in this setup. So I, ha I think like I, have, I have digressed quite a bit from the horses data and then the time series of the genetics. So now let's, let's get back. So we have a time series data. And I said that I want to use this kernel score and I want to plug it inside the posterior distribution or to do. But what should be the kernel I should be choosing, which would be reasonable to do? And then uh, we're looking into, there has been a lot of work in Oxford math. I think I will mention mainly Overhauser and uh, their group who has been working on that, that sort of work when you have uh, time ordered data, what is a kernel, what you should choose. Um, there, there is a fair amount of work. And in one of the recent works, they went back to a Rafa theory of Terry Lyons and some of their works, and then they used a signature-based kernel. And then they first proved that that gives you a proper scoring rule. And then the later, uh, it was extended recently by Christopher Salvi, showing that you, it's actually a strictly proper scoring rule. And not only that, Christopher gives us a very efficient numerical way of computing those uh, 
um, signature based kernel. So what is the signatures that I'm talking about? I will give you a very kind of hand wavy um, idea of what's going on. So let's say I have a time series data with these one, two, three, and four points, and I can compute the the x1 is this direction and this is x2 and this is time stamped and I can compute a path integral of along the x1 direction. So if I take 0 to big T then this is the whole length but I can also compute make the integration variable over time and then I can change and I can get two different paths which is like a path integral along the two and then I can iterate between these two paths and I can compute s12 and s21 which virtually gives you the area under the curves, the downside and upside. And you can continue these iterations more and more. If you have a very zaggedy time series, you will get more iterations will be needed to capture those uh, in between edges inside that. Uh, mathematically saying, that's what uh, all these uh, iterative path integrals means. Uh, if you are familiar with the Pickard's iteration for solving ODEs, that's what we actually use when you're doing the PD Pickard's iteration. And this is the tool which gave the field medal to Warwick. He was in Warwick at that time. But this is the, this path theory and Terry Lance work gives. But you finally end up being uh, this set of summary statistics, which are called signatures, and this is an infinite dimensional summary. There are theoretical works showing that this gives you moments for your time series data, um, in a sense. And you can just compute a kernel on that. There are theoretical proofs that this is a strictly proper score. So I can plug it inside my this generalized Bayesian setup as a score, which would let me prove the theorem, which gives me the Bernstein von Mises theorems, showing that it converges to the two posterior distribution. And this holds for any time series. I mean, you can give me any stochastic differential equations, including complicated ones like the Wright Fisher one, it still would work. So I know I have two minutes more, so I will just uh, try to do some comparison results uh, and then finally end up showing how does it work with the horse. Horses. So I compare with the work of Hey et al. 2020. There are other works, I think, but this is the only work which considers two locus setup. Uh, they actually solve a right Fisher diffusion with Euler Mariama discretization. I don't know how they actually correct. Uh, it was, uh, but I don't want to comment. And then they plug it inside a hidden marker model, and then they gives us an approximation to the likelihood. And you can do MCMC with that approximate posterior. So this is how the results. So what I'm showing here, it's actually the predictive performance after the inference. So the blue line, so if, if I, if, I mean, I'm computing another, another kind of score. So if the score value is very small, I know I have done well. So here, the blue line is learned after com, uh, inferen, inference using the generalized Bayesian setup, and the red one is from the Hayes paper. So uh, we get a very concentrated posterior on the true parameter value, and it gives you a very good predictive performance on the data set you have used. And here, different examples are over. So it is a two locus case, so you have like two different selection coefficients. You can take different sort of selection coefficients. It works overall in general setups quite okay. Uh, some tables. I think this is a three locus case. Uh, and we also generally, I mean, there is no other work, so you can do for three locus case, but it can easily extend to three locus case. It, it, any locus cases, it would be easily implementable. You don't really need to think of. Um, finally, the horse data now has been explored quite a bit. So we know there are two loci which uh, cause the golden color in the horses. So they were selected. So does it perform well? So in this case, uh, we consider again the reference of the Hayes paper. So the, I think the red line is the Hayes true parameter value, and then the black is the one, our map estimate, and this is the whole posterior distribution we get. Um, so I was quite impressed when the students showed me this posterior distribution. This looks rather, rather nice and things like that. Um, just, I think like that's more or less it. Before concluding the last 30 seconds, I will comment connecting one thing with Arno's uh, talk. So in this case, we had a simulator model coming from the right Fisher diffusion. And, uh, 
but the problem here is that we cannot differentiate the simulator as because there is a thresholding due to the boundary problem. So this is a setup where simulators are not differentiable. But if the simulator is differentiable as Arno has been showing, so one advantage you get that if it is differentiable, you can easily get an unbiased estimate of your gradient. So then you can use in the stochastic gradient MCMC or PDMP type methods. Uh, which in some of our other works we have shown that if you have a model like that and you can use all these uh, gradient-based MCMC, they scale up very nicely. I mean, you can handle 100, 200 dimensional parameter space nicely concentrated and rather fast. But that's uh, more from me. Yeah, happy. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I uh, studied in Copenhagen for some time, and they use another name for this thing, I think, uh, <laughs> because it, it looks like are the. I don't, don't exactly understand, so I'm not sure. I don't want to say stupid thing, but they call this thing estimating functions. Yeah, there's a. I mean, so basically, if you're just doing the minimum scoring rule estimate, you get the estimating equations. Yeah. And that's. Uh, I mean, they're calling us because Epi David called it estimating equations. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then you focused on the fact that they are consistent, but you have said very little about the variance. Uh, yes. So. so yeah, so they are consistent, but they are not efficient. So, I mean, you come up with different scoring rules. Different scoring rules will give you different contraction rates. With the, that's why the choice of uh, this signature-based one is uh, as because it gives you, as because it's more like a moment, so it contracts much faster. So okay. that's, that's where the, the trade-off comes in. Okay, because also in, in, uh, in Copenhagen, they have, they have ways of finding optimal estimating function, which is more or less... Okay, I should look into the literature. Related, yeah. I probably missed it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Um, so I guess uh, you've done all these kind of nice theoretical results. Uh, have you produced software um, for using this method? Yes. Yeah. So basically, we these things are all available now as a Python library. But I have a master student this uh, summer working with me. I grouped four of them. So they're uh, going to be working on a nice Python library using JAX and PyTorch both. Uh, hopefully by September we'll be releasing a library with. Uh, so they, we plan to use all possible SGMCMC, all possible PDMP, SPMC, everything. You just give me a simulator model, whether differentiable or not, and you can uh, simulate. So that, that's the goal. I mean, following up on ABCPy, that's what we want to do next. So that's a summer's project. So is that going to be part of a, a that package, or is it going to be a new package? It will be a new package, but it will have all the functionality. I mean, I'm trying to steal as much as I can from that. Yes. Let's uh, join in thanking Professor Itapita.